uh, we've all seen the boarded up dilapidated house, but I didn't understand the economic opportunity that exists there, not only from a profit standpoint, but from the ability to change a community and, and improve things significantly for the people on that street, the people in that community. Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Best Deal Ever Show. I'm your lovable host, Ken Corsini, who with my wife, Anita, have flipped over 800 houses in Atlanta since 2005 and even have a show on HGTV. But this show isn't about us. It's about all the amazing real estate investors out there that are crushing it. It's about their stories, their best deals, how they sourced them, how they funded them, and what we can learn from their experiences. This is the Best Deal Ever Show. Hey, this is Ken Corsini with the Best Deal Ever Show, and today I am joined by my good friend, Lee Arnold. Lee, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ken. Good. So you are out of, uh, it's funny, we just had this conversation. You were out of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And for the folks that don't know where that is, tell us where you are. Uh, Coeur d'Alene is in the upper panhandle of the state. So I'm about 100 miles south of Canada. Uh, so we are, wow. we are, we are very, very north. Yes. And you're right on the edge of Washington State, too, aren't you? Yes, we are. I'm about 30 miles from Spokane, Washington, which is eastern Washington. Uh, my office is about 30 miles away from Spokane. So very close. A lot of people don't know the uh, proximity, but uh, it makes for a great metro market for investing. Interesting. Well, And it's also just gorgeous up there, too, right? Oh, we love it. This is God's country up here, for That's sure. That's right. Now, are you, it's funny, because <laughs> it's just now October. and Haven't you guys already gotten the snow up there? Yeah, it's funny because my wife and I just got back from Maui like two days ago. We were there nine days. When we left here, it was 80 degrees and we got back and it was 30 degrees and we had two inches of snow. So uh, pretty, pretty interesting how think, how quickly things can change. But yeah, that is it's crazy. It's, it's been cold, man. Cold. <laughs> Which is the complete opposite. I'm here in Atlanta <laughs> and like every day this week, we're breaking like heat temperature records. Oh, it's, man. Just, it's like 95 today. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you get too hot and humid, come up north, man. We'll I'm, think, I'm thinking about it, man. I'm thinking <laughs> about it. So, so your your primary market then that you do most of your real estate is Spokane, then, or is it kind of one big metro? Well, uh, we do. So we basically have two sides to our company. Uh, one is we are a whole uh, full time flipper, so we flip about 100 properties a year in the Spokane Coeur d'Alene market. Uh, but then we are also a private money lender, and we lend nationwide. So for our own flipping business, we're pretty localized. Uh, but on our lending side, we are a nationwide lender. And you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, don't you guys do a good bit of education as well? Yes, we do have an education division and we put on real estate investment seminars around the country, usually two or three every weekend. So we are in a city near you pretty much every week. Wow. And is the education more along the lines of raising capital for, your, for, for the, the private money side of the business or is it just strictly education? Uh, it's strictly education, mainly because what we found is that to reduce risk from a lending perspective, uh, if we can educate the consumer to find better deals, write better um, offers, get properties for cheaper prices, that we can get them better loans, it reduces our risk, which ultimately translates to our lender's risk going down, our investor's risk going down, because we have a much more educated borrower that's getting in and getting out pretty quickly. So uh, that's the nature and the premise of those educational events is just to help people find great deals that financing is readily available for. Yeah. So really, I mean, you're just sourcing borrowers. You're around the country just building a book of business for your for the lending side. That is a great way to say it. That's exactly right. Very interesting. So yeah, you can now, I mean, I know your operation is pretty big. Tell us how big the operation is there up in Coeur d'Alene. Um, here at our corporate office in Coeur d'Alene, we're sitting right now at about 95 employees. Uh, and then we have another office in Spokane where our construction company runs as well as our uh, real estate division. I'm a licensed broker with Keller Williams. So I have a team under me with Keller Williams uh, and we're running about 20 people out of that office. Oh my goodness. That's a serious operation. Uh, and, and you're kind yeah. of at the, at the top. Are you CEO or what's your official title? Uh, I am the CEO, but I'm at the bottom. <laughs> I hear you, man. That's how I feel most days. I get that. That's funny. So what is your, on the flipping side of the business now, what's your primary business model? Are you just straight up buy, fix, flip? Uh, I would say that predominantly probably 50 to 60% of our deal flow is being sourced at foreclosure auction. Um, the, the remaining 40% is usually direct to seller. So we're doing a lot of direct mail. We're doing a lot of marketing, uh, internet, radio. Um, a lot of outbound phone calls, uh, whatever we can do to get ourselves in front of those borrowers so we can add more deals to the pipeline. Interesting. And you guys are mostly f just fixing those too, like full-blown renovations on those? Are you wholesaling anything? 
uh, we, we approach it from a six point angle. So on every deal that we find, we will first, of course, put it under contract and then we will attempt to wholesale it because we all know that the highest ROI in the business is wholesaling. Uh, so we attempt to wholesale it first if we're unsuccessful in wholesaling it. If the renovations are minor, we'll then go into what we call a wholetail strategy. Uh, wholetail is defined as any property that requires less than $10,000 in repair. So if we can put in less than ten grand, get it habitable, get it sellable, we'll get it staged, get it listed, get on the market. If the property is in such disrepair that we can't wholetail it, it needs $25,000, $50,000 in renovation, then we go to a retail strategy, which is to sell it at top of market, uh, depending on time of year. And then if we can't sell it for whatever reason, then we will attempt to sell or finance it and carry back the paper because as a lender, we're certainly more than willing to write paper. Uh, if we can't write paper, we'll lease option it. And then finally, last last ditch effort is we'll rent it out. Um, and it's our goal to have as few rentals as possible. Uh, not that I have anything against rentals. I think positive cash flow is a great business. Uh, but with the market where it is, it's been our position as a company that right now it's important to be flipping and maximizing your returns to build up your cash reserves. Uh, I know we're, we're all talking about recession and we all know that whether it comes this month or next year, it's coming. The market cycles every, every seven to 10 years in most markets. Uh, so my opinion, now is the time to be stockpiling cash to be ready for the next correction because there's not a single one of us that was in the business in 2008, nine and 10 that didn't say, man, I wish I would have had a, you know, a couple million dollars coming into that turn because when you saw what we were buying houses for in nine, 10, 11 and 12, Yep. I mean, we're paying 40, 50 cents on the dollar where we're at today. So for my clients, for us, for our investors, for our private equity funds, uh, we are flipping everything we can just to get that quick cash flow coming in, build up those reserves and be ready for that correction when it hits. Yeah, I can't agree with you more than now's the time to be stockpiling cash. Although I would caution folks that are in the flipping business, don't go out there and get a whole bunch of inventory that's going to take 12 months to flip. That's right. And then all of a sudden you're stuck with your pants down when it turns on yep. you. <laughs> yeah. Quick turn stuff. We try to avoid older inventory, uh, properties that were built before 1950, because you're inevitably going to be dealing with lath and plaster. You're going to be dealing with knob and tube electrical. And those types of repairs, especially when you consider the shortage we have in the labor markets, you know, getting electricians and plumbers these days is becoming more and more challenging. So when you have these major renovation projects, they can take, you know, 90 to 180 days. And it, with the market in kind of a an interesting place right now, I wouldn't want to be buying and holding anything that we can't get in and out of in less than 90 days. Yeah, I can't agree with you more. Now, tell me about the Spokane market. What sort of price points are you? I mean, I know Seattle, obviously, is crazy expensive. But on the other side of the state, what's it like? Um, it's It's rising dramatically. So if you look at a year over year appreciable increase just over the last five years, we've seen on average seven to eight percent annualized appreciation. So in five years, we've seen close to 50 percent increases. And what's causing that is a lot of uh, people migrating to this area because, you know, here in northern Idaho, northern Idaho is very, very conservative, uh, as is eastern Washington. Uh, Western Washington, which is where Seattle is located, very liberal, of course. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of people coming to this area just because they're tired of the politics in California. They're tired of the politics in some of their markets. And so we're seeing a rush of people coming up here. Uh, I would say 50 to 60 percent of them coming out of California. Well, if you sell a 800 square foot house in California, you're coming up here with a million dollars. And a million dollars in my market is going to buy you a 50 acre estate and a 6,000 square foot home with a big shop and a pool. Right. Uh, so that's really driving prices up here. Um, in the immediate area, Coeur d'Alene, I moved the office up here eight years ago. And where I'm at here in the downtown corridor, uh, I used to be able to buy houses for 120 to 125 uh, five years ago. That same house today is selling for 275 to 300. So wow. it's massive appreciation. And there was a publication just recently that said Idaho is the fastest growing state in the union, uh, driven mostly by Southern Idaho, the Boise Caldwell corridor. Uh, but again, it goes back to the conservative values and nature of the state of Idaho. Yeah. And people are surprised when they come up here because it's not the, the, the spud farming metropolis that people think when they think of Idaho potatoes. Uh, right. it, is, it has really become a major metropolitan city, and especially in uh, southern Idaho, a lot of tech companies moving over from San Francisco, Austin, Texas, they're all kind of migrating to Boise. So that's really pushing values up pretty aggressively. That's interesting. Now, I could see that there's sort of this migration away from uh, from California. Obviously, that was yeah. probably what's driving up the same thing in, in Seattle. It's driving up prices there. It's becoming yeah. really a, a real 
tech corridor. So you're yep. sort of saying the same thing in Spokane. That's interesting. Yep. yep. Without the rainy weather, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly right. And we are seeing a lot of people migrating over from Seattle as well, uh, simply because the population there, the traffic. So, you know, with the advent of the internet, thanks Al Gore for the internet. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Most of us can work from remotely, so it's no longer you have to live where you work. You can choose where you live, and you can commute uh, through your computer and your telephone these days. Sure. So uh, most housing choices, at least from what I'm seeing, are based more on lifestyle choice than I have to live here because of my job. So right. It's, it's a pretty interesting dynamic. Very interesting. So you guys uh, have a pretty big geographic area because you're covering Spokane and you're covering Quarter Lane, uh, mm -hmm. and it sounds like you're doing a pretty good volume at 100 a year. I mean, that's a pretty good clip. That's a lot of that's a lot of deals. Is there one deal in particular over the last couple of years that sort of sticks out as your best deal ever? Yeah, there is, and it's a deal and a process and a concept that I stumbled upon accidentally. Um, because we have these big vans that are wrapped with Kogo Capital. We lend money, and they're usually parked out front of our office. So a few years ago, I had a woman walk into my front lobby and say, hey, your van says you buy houses. Will you buy my house? And I met with her, and I said, sure, I'd love to buy your house. Tell me the situation. And the situation was that, unfortunately, when she retired from the Air Force, uh, she started dating a gentleman who was into drugs and manufacture of drugs and the sale of drugs. Smart. And, and they got themselves into a lot of trouble uh, with the city. So now the city has come in. They both ended up in jail. The house was run down. It was overrun by vagrants. It was dilapidated. And so the city kept fining this woman, you know, to clear the, the yard, clean up the house, needles everywhere. And I didn't realize at the time of her walking in that this, this is a major problem in most markets in America. And, you know, I've, we've all seen the boarded up dilapidated house, but I didn't understand the economic opportunity that exists there, not only from a profit standpoint, but from the ability to change a community and, and improve things significantly for the people on that street, the people in that community. Uh, so as she walked in, I looked at her situation and the city had fined her and had leaned the property like $65,000. Holy uh, cow. Yeah. And the house as it sat was worth, I mean, I bought the house for 26,000 uh, bucks. We put about 50,000 into it. And then when we sold it, our profit on was about $42,000. But the issue was when you looked at the title and you looked at how much she had been fined by the city, how much she had borrowed against this thing, she couldn't sell it for what she owed. Now we've all heard the term short sale, although it's not nearly as in vogue as it was in 2010, 11, and 12, but short sales are coming back, but short sales are always a viable strategy in any market sure. in a property where the homeowner owes more than the value of the asset. So we went in, we pulled title and I, I literally went down and I went and met with the city and code enforcement and everybody that was involved in this transaction. I said, look, you guys, I need you to forgive these liens. I will come in, I will fix up the house, I'll bring it up to FHA standards and I will sell it to an owner occupant that's going to occupy it and use it and do good things with it. But I need you to forgive these liens. Surprisingly, the city was very quick to comply and they said, yeah, wow. Lee, that's great. Uh, they did make me sign something called a performance guarantee, which I had never heard of, uh, but I completely understand. The performance guarantee essentially said, we, the city, will forgive the tens of thousands of dollars in liens and fines that we have against not only this homeowner, but this property, but you have to bring it up to FHA standards within nine months. And certainly I said, yeah, we can do that. That's not a problem. Uh, so we bought it and uh, paid 26000 for it, put fifty into it. We sold that house for $139,500. Uh, and the great part is, is that Jeanette, uh, the woman that we purchased the house from, even though she had absolutely no equity, she was going to get nothing out of this sale. We were able to negotiate it so that when she left closing, she also received $11,000 out of the closing proceeds. So it was a win-win for everybody. Jeanette got the money she needed to get her life back on track and to get moved into housing that the city hadn't abandoned or vacated or boarded up. Uh, the city got this troubled property off of their hands. In a two-year period, they had, had over 230 police calls to that property address. Oh, my so gosh. <laughs> The city was really excited to have that property off their hands and the neighborhood as a whole, that house was such a blight on that neighborhood. It was killing neighbors' property values. In fact, uh, when I acquired that house, I talked to the neighbor 
who had purchased his house for $120,000. But because of the condition of the house next door, when he tried to refinance, he couldn't because his property only appraised for $60,000. Oh, geez. When, when we got done and got this house sold, we created a comp, uh, cleaned up the neighborhood. His house then appraised within months of us selling ours, his house appraised for $160,000. So the wow. advantage of what we call a lien abatement or a nuisance property is there's literally hundreds and thousands of them in every market across America. Uh, and there's a huge opportunity for us as investors to go in and partner with our cities and align ourselves with our metropolitan areas so that we can clean up blight through partnership, co cooperative partnership with our cities uh, to clean up neighborhoods, to make it safer for kids to walk to school. Uh, it's one of my favorite strategies because I haven't seen a lot of people that are utilizing it. Um, it's a tremendous value add to the community. It, it helps the homeowner, it helps the, the neighbors, and it helps us as investors uh, to find good, clean, profitable deals. Oh, the, I, I, I can't agree with you more. In fact, I know a lot of investors, that's the, that is the list that they hit is code enforcement. Yep. Because yep. not necessarily even liens, although that would be a great list as well, but just code enforcement. Who's getting, who's getting cited by the city? Exactly right. And what I, and you and I know a lot of the same people can, what we have a tendency to do when we're dealing with those code enforcement lists is we prioritize the list based on which homeowners have the most equity. And I would encourage people mm. to not filter the list based on equitable spread, but rather just work every single lead the same. Because if the property's on the code enforcement list, it most likely is in a dilapidated condition. And it it creates a strong argument for a short sale, both with the underlying lien holder as well as with the city or the or the or, or the uh, the metro area that the property is located in. So there's tremendous opportunity to negotiate those liens down, so you can get the price to an area that you can afford to buy it and still make a profit. So in this particular case, did she have she had a, a mortgage on it as well that you were able to negotiate down? Yes, she had a mortgage on it as well. So we dealt with the mortgage. She had a second mortgage. She had liens from the city. She had, uh, we have something here called SNAP, which is the Spokane Neighborhood Area Protection, where if the house is in disrepair, the city will pay to come in and fix it up, fix the heater, make the property habitable. Uh, and when they do that work, they place liens against the property as well. So we were dealing literally with eight different lien holders on this property, and they were all willing to negotiate just so that something positive could happen with this property. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, they have to come to the table. Otherwise, it just sits there and nobody does anything and they lose all their money. So might as well get a little bit of something. Right. How, how did it work that she was able to actually walk away from the table with money? That's pretty rare in a short sale situation. Uh -huh. Well, I basically told everybody involved that if we didn't get Jeanette some money, the homeowner on this house, that she wasn't going to sign. You uh, know, because ultimately, the homeowner's in control until either they sign their rights away through sale or they lose rights through tax sale or auction. Well, both of those strategies or, or those opportunities were going to take the city two and three years to get to the tax sale status or for the underlying lien holders to initiate and, and execute on foreclosure. So they were willing to forgive those debts because it expedited the process and allowed the house to get into the hands of somebody that would do positive things with it. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty rare that they're willing to let the, you know, the, the seller actually walk away from the table with some money. So kudos to yep. you for some serious negotiating. You know, it's funny <laughs> when you had mentioned to me, you know, the kind of the, the state of affairs when she was in the house, first thing I think of is, was he, is there a chance that it was a meth house? Was it, a, was he cooking meth and what did you have to do in terms of abating that? Great question. Yeah, most of these code enforcement houses, well, I shouldn't say most, but I would say at least 60% of them, uh, we are dealing with either the, the use of illicit drugs on those properties, and in some cases, the manufacture of drugs on those properties. But it's just like anything else, you got to take it through the, the mediation process or the mitigation process. Uh, if there's manufacture of meth or mold, uh, it's kind of the same process for either, but you're looking on average anywhere from $2,500 to $8,500 in cleanup. Mm -hmm. uh, as I'm sure everybody probably knows, the remediation costs on use is significantly lower than the remediation on manufacture. Mm -hmm. But the advantage of these types of properties is, even though they're boarded up, as we're negotiating with the city and working to create positive solutions, the city will give us the ability to go in there, bring our inspectors, bring our contractors. So we know going in exactly what it's going to cost us to fix it up which is another big advantage over waiting for that house to go to auction where we would not be able to gain access to it. It's boarded up. We can't get in um, and really see what's happening there. So 
even though these properties do go to auction, there's, there's a tremendous opportunity to get to it before the sale so that you have the ability to go in and check those things out. Yeah. And you honestly use it as a negotiating tool because yes. there's a stigma with a meth house or a, you know, a house where the drugs are manufactured. You want to turn around that and take that to the negotiating table, and use right. it to your advantage. You know what you can you know, remediate it for. They, they probably are completely scared of the fact that they right. have this asset on their books now. Right. And one other thing I want to mention, Ken, just for your audience, is the other advantage of this strategy, more than any other strategy I've seen or that I work, is when you're when you're taking care of blighted properties in cooperation with the city and you do a great job, it's it doesn't take very many of these before the city is actually calling you and saying, hey, we have a situation over in this neighborhood at this property. Can you go talk to that homeowner and see if you can work with them as well? So from that first deal, I have wow. done dozens of these properties in cooperation with the city because they really need help el eliminating the blight and the issue. So wow. it, creates, it creates an amazing stream of repeat business because you now have a pretty, pretty important client, which is the city that you're doing business in. Great point. Yeah. It's, but you build a decent reputation for yourself in a city, you build those relationships and all of a sudden you're getting deals from it. But let's right. go back to how you originally got the deal. So this lady actually just saw one of your vans with the We Buy Houses on the side of it? Yep. Saw her van, walked into the office. And admittedly, uh, uh, I was not doing anything in code enforcement before she walked in. Yeah. I, I had no idea that there was a list. So yeah. uh, that would have been useful information. But since she walked into my office, and this is now going back four years, uh, code enforcement has become one of our main acquisition strategies. Interesting. And, uh, the other thing I'll mention is that most metropolitan cities with a population of greater than 50,000 have a code enforcement hearing. And in my market, they're held every single week. So track down in your city where those code enforcement hearings are being held, what time they're being held, and go. Hmm. Because I'm in, a, I'm in a metro market of about 500,000 people, and I'm always fascinated that when I go to these code enforcement meetings, I'm the only guy there. And really? you, got, you got the city and they're showing you all the addresses of the properties that are on their radar that they're trying to do work on. Uh, I mean, it's like fish in a barrel. One of, the, yeah. one of the most awesome strategies I've seen. Very interesting. It's funny. I don't think we have hearings necessarily in at least in our municipalities, but there's definitely a list. Yeah. The thing is I'm in a pretty competitive market in Atlanta. There's a lot of guys hitting that list, but if you're in a you know, slightly yeah. smaller market, like a, you know, medium Metro, like a Spokane, then golly, if you're the only guy there, you're right. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Right. Um, talk to us for a second about how you funded it. I know it wasn't, you know, any sort of massive deal, but, uh, you, you ended up having about 76,000 in it. Is that about right? 26 plus yep. 50. That's about right. Yeah. With Coco Capital, which is our nationwide lending arm, uh, we can lend up to 90% of your acquisition and a hundred percent of, of your rehab. So that allows us, you know, with $25,000 acquisition, it's $2,500 down and then Coco Capital will finance the entire balance. Um, and that's the other thing. I was just on a phone the other day with a guy that had gone to one of our events who years ago, uh, he said, I, Lee, I used to do a lot of business in code enforcement. He said, the challenge I had, though, is that a lot of these code enforcement properties are located in areas where most lenders won't lend. He said, so when I found out that Coco Capital not only teaches lien abatement and code enforcement as a strategy, but also provides the funding to acquire those assets, he said, I immediately jumped back into the real estate business because there's thousands of these homes and you guys are willing to finance them. So um, that's where we got the money, Ken, was through our lending arm, Coco Capital. And what sort of interest rate do you guys typically are? Obviously, you lend to yourself, you probably get it at a better rate, but what's, yeah. <laughs> what's typical? Uh, our rates start at one, one point in loan origination at 8% interest. Dude, that's uh, strong. That's really strong. Yeah. Yeah, and we will make we will match or beat any competitor's price. So if you've got pricing less than that, bring it to us. We will beat it. Man, that's phenomenal. So at the end of the day, you exited it just to a retail buyer, just went on right. the market, somebody bought it. I mean, that's still a really darn good price for a fully rehabbed house. What 139 is what you sold it for? Yep, 139.5. Yes. Yeah, I mean that's super affordable. And uh, and what did you make on that? Is it uh, forty two thousand three hundred seven dollars and three cents. That's total net net at the end of the day after all the commissions and everything got paid out. Yep, that's pretty darn solid, man. So so I mean I, I think I already know the answer to this, but how did this change your business? Um, it gave us the ability to focus on our core 
principal as an as an organization. Uh, if you ever walk into my office, Ken, you're invited to have, host you and your wife here in Coeur d'Alene. Come on up. Uh, but on the on the wall in our front lobby, it says we get more of what we want by helping others get more of what they want. So it's really the mission that drives us. And I didn't realize prior to this first deal the tremendous opportunity we have as investors to be a blessing to homeowners that are in a situation where they don't, they can't see the light. I mean, they're upside down. They can't sell the house for what they owe and they have no idea what their options are. So what this deal did to my organization is it gave us another opportunity to serve our community, to, to serve our neighbors and to be a blessing to other people while still being profitable. Uh, and, and that's why it's truly one of my favorite strategies. That's amazing. You know, it's funny. My wife, Anita, that is, I think she wants to trademark it, be a blessing. She actually has cups and hats and everything written with be a blessing. That is completely her, her life mission right now is to be, mission, to be, to be a blessing. And, you that's know, awesome. to, to your point, uh, it's funny how many new investors, you know, they, they sense blood in the water and they start licking their chops. And it's, such, it's the wrong way to go about it because we right. really, at the end of the day, should be problem solvers. And whether right. we make money or not, it, it always will build a better business if you're just right. in it to help people, not just to take okay. advantage of people. That's right. Yeah. If you can focus on how is my effort going to bless this person in the absence of profit, you know, that's when I believe God will truly begin blessing your business when it's not about the money, rather it's about the benefit and the blessing that you can transfer to other people. Yeah. And like I said, at the end of the day, it really was a win-win. You guys, you made profit. There's nothing wrong with making profit from the deal, right. but right. you actually lifted her situation. She walked away from the table with money, all these debtors and credit. They, they got out of the you know, house that they didn't want to be part of. And at the end of the day, everybody won. That's and right. you still profited from it. Right. And I think for a lot of investors, Ken, the reason they steer away from this particular side of the strategy, as in looking at properties that are over encumbered, is admittedly, it's a lot of work Yeah, you know, to, to go through and negotiate with eight different lien holders. It is a lot of work. And there is no guaranteed paycheck at the end of that effort. Yeah. But if, if the paycheck is the focus, then then I don't know that you're going to be truly blessed in your business because I think you're focused on the wrong things. Yeah. If you, if you can approach every deal, not from the standpoint of how much money am I going to make, but how many people am I going to serve? I believe that's when your business will start truly being blessed. Yeah. man, that is a fantastic word to end on. Lee, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a fantastic one. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Ken. I appreciate right. it. Take care. You too. Thanks for listening to the Best Deal Ever show brought to you by Bigger Pockets. If you've been energized, entertained, or enlightened by today's show, please feel free to hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Ken Corsini or check us out online at redbarnhomes.com. And don't forget, one man's best deal ever may be the inspiration you need to create your next best deal. So hope to see you on the next episode. 